But anyhow, I was going to say one of the things, and um, part of that, I got to um, meet a number of their talented wardens. They're a small system, much like North Dakota, the system wide. And I actually met all three of their wardens. They were that small and very talented. And they were so proud of the work they were doing. I'm like, I want to hear more. And under the leadership of Commissioner Randall Liberty, they have done some amazing work in Maine. And so I reached out after I was hearing that and actually Pat Caruso, one of our associates um, uh, was in Maine and actually toured their facilities and came back and said, that's the real deal. And so I reached out and of course we have Dr. Ryan Fernell who is a deputy commissioner for the Maine Department of Corrections. And he said he would be more than thrilled to share the work that they are doing. And one of the things you will hear from Dr. Thornell about is that you can't just focus on the housing unit of restrictive housing. It's a system-wide approach that you have to take. And their, and their journey has many steps to it as you will hear um, Ryan talk about. And so I am really pleased to introduce Dr. Ryan Fernell, who currently serves as the de Deputy Commissioner for the Maine Department of Corrections, who was appointed in April, 2018 in that capacity. He's responsible for day-to-day -day management and operations of the department. And this role also provides specific oversight of legislative and policy matters, medical and behavioral health services, correctional programming and treatment services, adult facility operations, and adult community corrections. Dr. Thunell's priority is enhancing the overall wellness of the correction system, emphasizing normalization, humanization, and modernization of the department's staff, residents, and practices to produce positive, healthy, and sustainable outcomes. Beginning as a correctional officer in the South Dakota Department of Corrections, good Midwest boy, uh, Dr. Thornell has served in the corrections field for 17 years, spanning multiple states, and has experience in adult and juvenile corrections. He received his master's degree in criminal justice from the University of Cincinnati, and went on to receive his doctorate in political science from the University of South Dakota. So Ryan, I'm really pleased to have you here and take it away. Oh, and because I want to make sure that you know, this is not just a presentation PowerPoint and click. This is an interactive. So Pete, please feel free to ask questions and engage while he goes through his great story in Maine. Well, thank you, Leanne. And uh, thank you all for having me. Um, and good morning. It's, it's weird to say good morning, I have to tell you, because of our time change. Um, I feel like it should be two or three in the afternoon for some reason. Um, and so if I say anything about the afternoon time, that's why uh, I'm now a Mainer struggling to uh, adapt back to the Western part of the United States. Um, but thank you for the introduction. Um, and I, I won't, I'll emphasize really um, one thing, two things from that introduction, if I could, uh, just real quick. Um, one is that I started my career at South Dakota State Penitentiary as a corrections officer when I was 19 years old. Uh, that's where I met Denny Kamink, um, who I'm glad to see here today, um, and became lifelong friends with him and learned a lot from him um, in his previous role. But I emphasize that because for me, it's critically important to the work that I'm going to talk to you about and hopefully talk with you all about that we're doing in Maine um, to have that perspective on the front line as a corrections officer or a case manager or something along those lines in this, in this business, because we, cut, we, we often speak about policy changes, practices, enhancements and things, but it's critically important to maintain that line staff members viewpoint when, when we're having those conversations, because at the end of the day, we can say everything we wanna say, but if they don't buy into and know how to carry out that work and why we want them to carry out the work for those reasons, um, it, it's, it's all lost. And so I just wanna emphasize that. And I also emphasize it because I often get coined as an academic. For some reason in our field, in positions, when you have a PhD or some sort of degree attached to your name, you get coined as the academic and people like to dismiss things that you say, not this audience, I realize, but it's so it's important for me to, to make sure, you know, people know I'm, we're more than just academics in, in this business and working alongside doing what's smart and best alongside our line staff is really the intersection, I think, of what we do going forward. And the last thing I'll just say real quick as an introduction is I apologize, Commissioner Liberty could not be here with me today. He stayed back in Maine uh, to deal with our 12 inches of snow that we received um, yesterday. So hopefully we can make this clicker work, maybe. If not, you just want to go to the next slide? 
we'll do it that way. So just real quick, what I hope to share with you all is uh, just two things, really. One is what we've done with restrictive housing in Maine um, and give you the kind of the nuts and bolts where we were, uh, where we are today. And then more importantly, uh, what Leanne mentioned is um, what we believe in Maine is really the strategy and solution to restrictive housing and its previous overuse and enhancing its, its use going forward is a systemic approach to corrections, uh, some of which I've heard being talked about already this morning and I know was on the agenda previously and in previous meetings um, that we're carrying out here in Maine. And then I'll ultimately wrap up with a few lessons learned that we hope to share with all of you um, as you go through the work as well. Next slide. So a little bit about Maine. Um, if you are, if you haven't been there, if you're not from there, or from around there, um, Maine is a small state, population-wise. Geographically, it's a large state, about eight hours from border to border. Um, and just on the map up here, you can just see our correctional facility. It's not important to know the names of them right now or anything like that. But really, the importance of this map is to show you the large landmass, but to emphasize how small the state really is. And so, as a department we have roughly 1,600 adult men and women incarcerated in Maine across the entire state. And I emphasize that for a couple of reasons. One is it allows us to do what we do, which is make big changes um, pretty quickly, try them out. And then if they don't work, we go to something else. And we can do that because we're a very small department. We only have three secure facilities across the entire state. And we have three uh, minimum community custody facilities and I also emphasize that because I realize many of you have facilities in your state that would house our entire population in one facility um, and most likely all of one higher custody when we're dealing with a whole host of custody ranges. Um, you can also see the average age of one of our incarcerated residents is 41. That's often higher than many of which, what you deal with. The state of Maine's population overall averages the age of 47. So we're an older state. And I don't mean to offend anybody by saying that, but we're an older state um, by all accounts compared to other states. Um, and then lastly, uh, we have low crime, low incarceration rates, as you can tell by our numbers. Um, but that just gives you a little bit of a background. Uh, the, again, the real thing I want to emphasize is we make quick changes in Maine because we're so small. And that's why I think you're going to see and hear things today that you might think we can't do that in our state. Um, but really, our population, although it's small, reflects nearly all of the dynamics of a typical correctional population, uh, whether it's violent crime inside or out, substance use disorder, opioid use disorder, violence. Uh, we have our own STG issues, right? All of those different dynamics that you all deal with maybe on a grander scale, we still deal with within those 1,600 men and, 1600 men and women, just in a little bit of a different scale. Next slide. So I'll take you just briefly on a, a kind of a pictorial journey of restrictive housing in Maine. Um, we always like to talk about um, the old Maine State Prison in Thomaston, Maine, um, largely because it's where corrections in Maine got its roots, but also it was the uh, prison that influenced Shawshank Redemption um, being in Maine. Um, as you know, the history behind the film and all of that, that was the prison that really uh, illustrated what you saw in that film, but it also was our early solitary confinement restrictive housing areas. So you can see cell rows on the left. Uh, these are circa 1940s and then a recreation uh, area on the right. Next slide. So this shows our evolution into the early 2000s. In late 1990s, as the rest of all of your states were going through the supermax prison boom, uh, Maine also did that, and we opened up what you see in front of you, um, which soon became the Maine State Prison in the early 2000s. The Supermax building was established in the late 1990s, and then they tore down the Thomaston Prison and opened up a new prison on the same site. And it is what housed our quote unquote Supermax restrictive housing setting. Um, so this represented the modern uh, approach to restrictive housing, solitary confinement, what have you. Um, and you can see you know, secure tray slots. It was 23 hour lockdown. Um, it had metal, what, you know, the, the industry is historically called cages in the rec yard. 
um, and other things like that that reflect really that approach to locking people down in a very secure 23-hour uh, restrictive sort of environment. This unit, um, as you see, as we transition to the next slide, this unit closed down in 2015. We emptied it out and we transitioned into where what we currently have for a restrictive housing unit you see here, um, which houses what we consider to be our longer term, um, I'll put restrictive housing in quotes, because the definitions always change. Uh, by definition, it's not restrictive housing, but we consider it to be. Um, and this is what houses anybody that we need to be locked down in some sort of restrictive setting. It typically houses nine to 12 people any given day, it holds up to 32. But you can see, we transitioned into this space. It was an old part of the facility, wasn't being used at all. It was an old mental health unit gone wrong. Um, so we had it shut down offline for many years. But you can see it has much better daylight. Uh, beyond those windows is an outdoor space where there's plenty of ample space to get out and recreate. And it provides for more of a direct supervision interaction with officers and others. And so that's why we transitioned into this space as our population wound down, which I'll explain here in a few minutes. So this is what we have now as our restrictive housing unit. And like I said, when we go now into the next slides, I'm going to walk you through a little bit about how we got to the ability to shut down one unit into a much better space and operate where we're at today. So many of you know, uh, former commissioner in Maine, Joe Pont, um, and I know he was uh, very active in this group amongst uh, other groups. So Commissioner Pont came to the Department of Corrections in 2011 and brought a much different approach to corrections than Maine uh, was ever used to. And a lot of people loved him, a lot of people hated him. And, uh, you know, I think that was probably the mark of success for him. Um, and you know, one of the things that he's credited with, rightfully so in Maine, is really kicking off a different look at restrictive housing. It's not where we're at today, but it sparked where we're at today. And what he brought to Maine that we didn't have before is a level of accountability in the restrictive housing process that, that really, again, sparked our transparent process and our documented process, really our meaningful process um, that we have today. And so things that he did was he made sure that placements going into restrictive housing were properly vetted, proper paperwork, proper timelines. He made sure all the documentation was in place. And he made sure when somebody needed to come out of restrictive housing, they were brought out of restrictive housing and brought back to general population. When he came into that setting, there were wait lists to go into restrictive housing. It was that flawed of a system. And so somebody would move out on somebody's subjective decision and then they would bring somebody else in months, sometimes even years after their disciplinary sanction into restrictive housing. And it was just full all the time. So under his leadership, his push, the population reduced, came in under 50, which is what the housing unit was meant to hold, hovered between 40s and 50s. Um, and, and it transformed what we were doing. Okay, And again, it upset a lot of people, but it was necessary. It, was, it, was, it needed to happen. One thing, a couple things it didn't do was because he then left in 2014, as many of you know, and went down to New York City. Um, so a couple things it didn't do was it really didn't get into the meat of what was happening inside of restrictive housing. And so it took care of making sure, you know, the numbers were down, the process was accountable on paper, people knew what was happening in and out in terms of who was coming in and who was going out, but it didn't really dive into the interventions that were happening. And so what we saw was still a lot of self-injurious behavior, not a lot of treatment intervention, a lot of lockdown time, okay? And so it didn't really get to the things we're gonna talk about here today. And so in 2014 uh, into 2015, and we'll go to the next slide, there's a video on it, but it doesn't play because I was told this morning I might not be smart enough to embed a video into a PowerPoint like I thought I was. Um, but so we can go to the next slide um, now, but. What the video showed, and many of you probably saw this um, back in 2015, 2014 and into 2015 when it aired, but as Commissioner Pont was leaving, he gave this unprecedented access to PBS Frontline to come into our segregation unit at the time, the one that we closed down, and told them we're transforming restrictive housing. He wanted to showcase the plan and the work that was being done. And when I say unprecedented access, I mean it. They were in that housing unit, producers, filmers, and cameras 24 seven 
for a pretty good stretch of time. And any, any of you in the business know what goes wrong when you put a camera in front of our population, heck, even our staff, probably any of us, that amount of time, right? It, it didn't go well. And so when PBS Frontline aired Solitary Nation, which I was showing you a teaser of a minute of it, it showed, you know, the things that we don't want to see in restrictive housing. It showed a lot of blood, a lot of violence, a lot of in-cell lockdown, just everything you don't want to see. And it sent really the wrong message that was intending to be sent when the project started. So Maine quickly became defined by a solitary nation. And it, it, it horrified our governor, everybody. So when we moved into uh, 2014, into 2015, on the heels of that airing, um, Commissioner Pont had left, Commissioner Joe Fitzpatrick, um, came to the helm. He was a psychologist. Um, and so he brought a little bit of a different approach on the heels of that airing. And he called for a complete overhaul of what we do for restrictive housing. And so several steps took place in that year. Uh, one of which was uh, we appointed uh, Warden Liberty at the time, now Commissioner Liberty. He became warden of the main state prison, and I was assigned to oversee the overhaul of restrictive housing. So he and I had worked together previously. Um, and so we teamed up and we tackled what became what we consider to be our meaningful reform to restrictive housing in Maine, um, really focused on culture change, um, policy and practice change. But really, the biggest change was undoing the years and the decades of practices that had gone on and really working to transform what our officers were thinking, were doing, and how they were behaving in those units that translated into what our residents were doing. Um, we also took a different approach away from the traditional approach to placing some in restrictive housing, and we made a commitment to do everything with a multidisciplinary team. And that was the most critical thing we did right out of the gates, and we forced it on them. Okay? And when I say multidisciplinary team, sure, we had security at the table, but more importantly, we had behavioral health at the table, we had medical at the table. We had our case management staff at the table. Sometimes we had family members, you know, at, they'll say at the table, but on the phone in writing with us, communicating about their individuals, their loved ones that were in restrictive housing, helping us really change what was happening. And we took that approach to every single thing that we did, whether it was a policy change, a programming change, or a staff training change, because we needed the department to start realizing that restrictive housing wasn't just about security. It was about doing something with those individuals while they were in that setting. And that multidisciplinary team really brought that, that component to it. The other thing we did in addition to the multidisciplinary team is we took a new look at accountability on the heels of what Commissioner Pont had started just a couple of years previous to us. And what we did is we took his focus on documentation, transparency, policy, and adherence to timelines and those things. And then we put meaningful steps along the way so that when a resident came in to restrictive housing, they knew exactly why they were there. Staff knew exactly why they were there. They knew exactly what to expect while they were there from security measures all the way to timelines and interventions and communications. Right. And then they knew exactly what was necessary and the associated timeline to get out of there. And we held ourselves to that. And we held ourselves to that by taking some, some pretty significant measures in that nobody could enter into a restrictive housing unit without my approval as at the time, the associate commissioner. So they had, so somebody from the main state prison had to make a phone call to me, which they never wanted to do to put somebody into restrictive housing, regardless of the behavior, in order to make sure they went in with the right process in front of them. And many of you might be thinking, that is not how you change culture. That is not how you transform a department. And I agree with you 100%, and it's not where we are today, but it was necessary to kickstart what we did and we've been doing over the subsequent five or six years from there. It, we had to rip the Band-Aid off and start fresh, and that's how we did it. And staff then started understanding what we meant by accountability. It wasn't about getting them in trouble. It was about helping them out so that the process flowed the way that we said it should flow. It was about giving them the tools to make it flow that way. 
Next slide. By the way, if you have any questions, please jump in. Yes. I got a question. Yes. So on the point you just made, uh, because I understand the need for the control to them coming in, how did the, I know the staff probably didn't take well to it, but what was the dynamic between the offender who then didn't go into restrictive housing I mean, can you talk a little bit about what that was like? Absolutely. Uh, excellent question. Thanks for asking. And, and I think it'll, it'll come together a little bit more as I talk, but I'll, I'll, I'll say now, one of the things we quickly realized is that we needed to do more on our general population housing units in order to help them remain stable when that individual stayed in that unit. And so what I'll talk about in a little bit is how we did that, some of the interventions and things we put in place. But that was absolutely a critical component to this. And it created, you'll see in some of the data that I show, only a few slides of data, I promise. You'll see, though, that we had some upticks in some things that we didn't want to have upticks in within the first you know, 18 to 24 months for that very reason. Because somebody was getting kept out of restrictive housing at my call or at the warden's call, because we often agreed and something was then happening out in the general population uh, housing unit that created a greater level of instability and staff were not happy with us, of course. The residents felt empowered, right? And so we had made this critically necessary change to our restrictive housing process, but we hadn't done the bigger work out in the general population area, which is where we're gonna turn the presentation here shortly. So thank you for forecasting that. Um, so real quick, this slide simply highlights really the general goals of restrictive housing reform that we went into our approach with. And we really went into our approach um, because he and I spent a week together, which many of you have probably done out in Aurora, Colorado, at the National Institute of Corrections. And they told us all we needed to know about managing uh, in restrictive housing. And so we came back and these were really our general goals. Um, much like many of you would all have, and you probably all have across your department and how you re use restrictive housing. Um, what's important here to, to point out is really, I think two things. One is what Leanne started off with is, and I appreciate, we haven't used the word eliminate when we're talking about restrictive housing, right? So we use the words like reduce and divert because we understand, and we're gonna talk more about Restrictive housing has its purpose in corrections if it's done correctly, if it fits within an overall system. And so the general goals are to reduce and divert, but also to create a meaningful process so restrictive housing fits in where it needs to fit in to an overall, what we consider to be a healthy system. And the other thing I just want to point out is the bottom, the, the bottom goal, which is diverting special populations from restrictive housing and it's probably one of the most challenging goals of restrictive housing reform. Because again, it not only requires that you have a more stable general population area that allows for them to not be in restrictive housing, but as we know, we know what brings people to restrictive housing. We know what, we know what creates high risk factors for them, but it is incredibly difficult to impact those areas. It's incredibly difficult to deal with an acute mental illness, right? It's incredibly difficult to deal with decades of trauma, right, or substance use disorder, what have you. It, it's incredibly difficult to deal with somebody who's 21 years old, right, and hasn't fully developed their brain, right? And so it's important that that be a general goal, but also be realistic that that takes a significant amount of time. Um, and for us, it's taken a better part of five years. Next slide. So what that means here in Maine, um, as we are going into the restricted housing process, um, what the meaningful reform sort of idea means. This is what we set out to do on the ground level, taking those general reforms and putting them into policy, procedure, and practice changes. Number one was increase the meaningfulness of the placement, which I've already spoken about, making sure that there's meaningfulness to the process, uh, which we quickly learned through the court process because we were sued. And uh, we made sure that our process was meaningful um, by the time that court case was done. Increased time and activity outside a cell. This, for me, this is a big one. This is one I stress within our department because we often get so caught up in 
these hour blocks, right? Definitions and things that say one hour out or two hours out, or if you achieve four hours out, you're this status. But we really don't sit down and really ask ourselves, what is the appropriate time out of somebody's room and for what, right? So for us, we identify ACA definitions in our policies and we meet those definitions. But for us, it was, let's go beyond those ACA definitions. Let's figure out, is it three hours that they need to be out? Does this person need to be out five hours because of what they need while they're in restrictive housing? And maybe this person should start out at the two hour mark, right? And so defining what we mean by time out of cell and not applying a one size fits all approach to everybody in that setting is critically important. The other piece is increasing the interventions, programmings that are in place. Okay, and we get, as an industry, we get caught up in finding out what the next great program is, right? And what's evidence-based. And we really just had to take a step back and pull out a lot of the things that we thought were working at the time and just find out what these individuals need. And the things that we found were not all of the off-the-shelf sort of programs. We found it was really education. We found it was really contact with behavioral health, meaningful contact with behavioral health. Right? We found that it was really about socialization, proper socialization. And yes, we sprinkled in CBT programs and other things, but we really had to take a step back and ask ourselves, what do we mean when we say, how do we program somebody in restrictive housing? How do we meaningfully intervene? Because it's not as cut and dry as we often hear that it should be. It was also about diverting special populations. As I mentioned, this is incredibly difficult to do has taken us years to figure this out. We opened up an intensive mental health unit uh, in the year 2014. Best thing we did as a department. It is full constantly, right? 32 beds, 32 people in there coming from the county jail system and across our system. And it's incredibly important, incredibly expensive, but incredibly important, right? We're able to divert those mental health cases out. But we have to do more, and we're learning to do more to divert others out of that as well. The young adults that come into our system at the age of 18, 20, many of them come into our system destined for restrictive housing. They come in with every single warning sign they could have, every flag, probably because they spent the previous four years at our juvenile facility with the same exact warning signs. And so we have to figure out how to divert those cases. We have to figure out how to divert those who need different levels of education intervention. And so for us, again, it was about defining what this means beyond the standard of what we hear. Last thing is, it was about figuring out how we mark this as a success, right? How are we going to know at the end of the day, if we were successful or not? And what we've come to, what we've come to learn is we're not going to know. Overall, we're not gonna get a passing grade by somebody, but what we do know is we now measure success by somebody's overall wellness. And you'll see that, that terminology in here, and I'm gonna to talk to you in a little bit uh, about terminology and the things that we do as a department, which is impacting restrictive housing. But wellness is really what our measure of success is now, individual wellness. Somebody comes into us, they're unhealthy, not medically, medically, but also, educationally, financially, uh, skills training, right? Trauma. And so we now gauge our success by how we impact that wellness, their overall wellness. And we do that through their time with us, the positives and the negatives, and then hopefully their release and what happens with them in the community and that continuity of care process. But I put that on here as a restricted housing comment because that wellness is on full display in restrictive housing, the lack of wellness because of all of those factors that are happening that I've already mentioned. Next slide, please. All right, so what this looks like now is really a bunch of numbers up here, but I'll just tell you, we still have restrictive housing in Maine. Anybody who tells you that we've eliminated restrictive housing is lying, okay? We don't call it by anything different, right? We own what we have. And what we have, we think, is a good process that fits into our appropriate spot in our overall system. We have an administrative status, similar to what many of you have. Okay, it's the first 24 to 72 hours. Somebody commits a violent act in general population, 
and we bring them to a restrictive housing setting while we investigate it. One of the key differences is here is that we cap it at 72 hours. And so to go beyond 72 hours, it has to go to myself or the commissioner to say that. So we no longer have investigations taking 14 days, 30 days, 60 days, because we know in the industry, that's how somebody gets buried in restrictive housing is investigations just go on and on and on. We know within that first 72 hours, what really needs to happen to that person based upon what they did. If they're destined for disciplinary segregation, we go through the discipline process, we put them on disciplinary segregation where they catch a little bit more time, 30 or 60 days typically, depending on the violent incident. The other change that we've made is administrative status can take place out in general population. Because a lot of the reasons people were going into restrictive housing on administrative status really didn't require a full lockdown restrictive housing setting. It really just, we needed 24 to 48 hours to really figure out what was going on with that individual. So why take them out of their general population area with the officers that they've been interacting with, the case managers they've been interacting with. And so we, we made a change in policy so that by and large, almost all of our administrative statuses happen in our general population area. They come off that status and they're just back onto their general population status because we really don't need to do much more with them other than intervene in some sort of meaningful way. They don't need the heavy lockdown setting. And if they did, because maybe it was a stabbing because we have those in Maine, right? Then they go to the restrictive housing unit and they go through that process. So you can just see um, average length of stay is three days on ad status for a male, one day for female. Average length of stay on disciplinary segregation for males is 39 days, zero for females. In large part, I don't want that female number to, you know, portray that we don't have uh, females that need disciplinary segregation time or anything like that, but we only have about 110, 115 women in our entire system. And so when we have one, it's an outlier um, and it, it, it becomes an all hands on deck sort of, sort of case. And then finally, we have our administrative controls unit, which is that longer term, technically not a restrictive housing setting, but that's really where somebody goes in our system if they need to be in a contained restrictive environment for any period of time beyond 30 or 60 days. And they're out of their room anywhere from four to 10 hours a day, depending on why they're there, what they need, what their interventions are, how long they're gonna be there until they get out, how they socialize with others. The beauty of our administrative controls unit, which is that last unit I showed you, the brighter unit that was closed down that we moved into, is it is direct supervision, as I mentioned. And so we're able to bring out three or four people at a time, take their restraints off them, socialize them in the day room, and it gives us the ability to see what they're gonna do. And so it, it's like, it's almost like just observing them like a museum. And we're able to see how they interact with each other. And then we can make informed decisions about them. Maybe transition them out to general population. Now, do we get it wrong sometimes? Do they start fighting? Do attempted stabbings? Absolutely. Had one just about two months ago in the rec yard because of it. But it, it's about taking that risk and using that environment to see if we're making a meaningful intervention. And if not, what do we need to retool? What are we missing about that individual to get them back into general population? Next slide. Um, so just real quick, visually, this just shows you the reduction in restrictive housing um, along the way. As I mentioned, um, you can see a couple periods of spike, right? And one of the lessons learned from all of this is we cannot lose course when we get one of those spikes, right? We have to stay the course. But you can see in 2015 to 2016, and then again in 2018 and 2019, we had two spikes, where we had significant incidents and significant placement increases. And it was in large part back to your point earlier that we were either keeping people out in restrictive housing, out of restrictive housing, or sending them out a little bit too soon without the right tools in place. And so we were seeing incidents go up, returns to restrictive housing. We also saw some population spikes at those same times. So we were dealing with different pressures than we were dealing with day to day. And that contributed to it. 
But by and large, overall, we've seen an 87% reduction in restrictive housing since we started the 2015 work till now. Next slide. And this just shows you another visual way of seeing the average length of stay has significantly decreased um, the average amount of time somebody would spend in restrictive housing since we started this work. And this is critically important to us because we want to get somebody out of that setting as fast as we can with the right structures in place to do so in a safe environment. And it's important to mention before we go to the next slide is the only reason this is possible and we maintain the restrictive housing numbers as low as we do is because of what is happening out in our general population housing units. It is not about what's happening in our restrictive housing units. And so that's what I want to shift gears to when we go, we'll go to the next slide, but I'll pause real quick if there's any questions specific to the restrictive housing components that I covered. All right. So the last few slides here are really talking about what we consider to be our model of corrections, which is one based in wellness, as I mentioned earlier. And I want to just give you an overview, a couple slides on what that means to us and how it really uh, impacts what we're doing day to day in every aspect of our department, um, whether it's facility or community corrections. But for this setting, I'll talk uh, about facility. But really, without a healthy system, overall, a continuum within that system, the work we do doesn't, doesn't mean much because we do something here at the front end and then we might lose it at the back end. Or we do something nice in the middle and then we lose it on the back end, right? So if we don't have a healthy system, what are we really doing, right? And at the end of the day, our goal through all of this is public safety and making stronger main communities. And we believe we're doing both, even though we get criticized at times because the approach we're taking is not the traditional hardened corrections approach. So our model of corrections is based in normalization, which you're gonna hear a little bit of the initiatives going on there, humanization and destigmatization. So everything we do now, and I have a warden in the room who can attest to this, Everything we do now is based in those three things. So if we want to roll out a new policy, we ask ourselves, how do we normalize it? How do we make it most look like they're going to experience in the community in a safe way? How do we humanize it? How do we make sure we're approaching them as humans in a respectful manner with what we're doing and ensuring that they approach us in the same manner, right? Building more of a community within our facilities and then destigmatizing the work that we do along the way, right? So that not only destigmatizing the, the impacts in the lives of our residents, but there's a tremendous amount of stigma around our staff and the work that they do every day. And so we wanna make sure that our efforts in all of this impact the work our staff are doing in a positive manner as well. Next slide. So I want to just talk through some of the initiatives and I'm not going to do any of them justice because of the time and the focus, but I, I just cover a few of them. Um, the first one is what I was just mentioning is destigmatization. Uh, we have what we call language matters initiative. And we rolled that out about two and a half years ago um, as we were really making some, I think, uh, some big swings at changing our overall department. And our language matters initiative really did what I just mentioned is it took a different approach to the stigma around corrections. So we rolled out a whole new language approach. We, as you've heard me say, we refer to those incarcerated as residents, those out on probation as clients, right? We use person first language when we're talking about treatment, right? Behavioral health treatment, substance use treatment, problem sexual behavior treatment. We don't refer to individuals as sex offenders. Right? We refer them with as a person in need of problem sexual behavior treatment if we don't just refer to them as a resident. Right? We refer to our staff as officers, Mr. and Mrs., right? respectful language like that. And we do that in everything we do. We, we make sure that how we communicate with victims is in a manner that's empowering the voice of a victim. 
right? And not speaking down to them because they have an important role in all of this. And then we try to use all of our language as a manner to tie back to that effort of wellness and stronger main communities. So that when we're speaking about something, people can make the connection to what it means for public safety in the community, what it means for a stronger community in Maine when these individuals return home or when our officers go back home. Educational services, critically important. And I know you're gonna hear about that uh, later this afternoon and you've heard a lot about it already, but we know without a doubt that education is the single most important thing we can give somebody in our facilities by far. And so while we've been going through the restrictive housing work, we've had parallel tracks in our education world that have us now having PhD students in our facilities. And we have educational services all the way through graduate level across every one of our facilities, including those who go into and out of restrictive housing. And that means, another point on here, is we have to take risks with technology, right? Which makes a lot of us uncomfortable to do. But in order for an individual at our maximum security prison to be involved in college, it's really hard to do without a laptop. It's really hard to do without an internet connection, right? And I'm not saying we give them internet inside their room. Some facilities have that, some facilities don't. But they have to have an ability to do that, to have that engagement, to have that meaningful education process. A few other things that we've done, uh, we've trained our staff in a whole different way of doing corrections. We've trained our staff in communication, de-escalation, but maybe more important, resiliency. How to be resilient in very challenging situations. How to know what's going on with your internal body as you approach that cell door, as you approach that group of individuals maybe out in the rec yard, how to, how to know what's happening here so that as you go to approach them or him or her, you can regulate yourself and you can be resilient through whatever that situation is. So it's critically important that alongside everything we do in restrictive housing, across our department, we've been training our staff to be more in tune with what's happening with them and how that translates into their communication and interaction with individuals. And the last thing I'll mention on this slide is uh, the diversity, equity, and inclusion the commitment that the department has made to DEI work with all of our staff and all, all, all of our residents. We know that the BIPOC community is overrepresented in our facilities in Maine. They make up roughly 13% of our population in our facilities. And if you know anything about Maine, they make up only about 3% of the population, general population in Maine communities. And so it's critically important to us that we recognize that diversity, that we empower that diversity, and that we make sure that that diversity is included and there's an inclusive process into our policy and practices, which includes resident input into those policies and practices. Next slide. whole other list of things as well that again i can't dive into all of them but i do want to call out um two things first is the impact that our women's services division has had on the wellness of our entire department and it's important for me to make reference to this because our women's services division has been out in front of the needs and services and the best ways to incarcerate women um, for many years uh, we have a very strong director of women's services. If you've ever met her, she's a trailblazer. And uh, she, she consults with a lot of states because of that. And we did not know the gem that we had as a department until about three or four years ago when we really started seeing the outcomes with our women residents. And we really started unpacking what was going on with our male residents and figuring out a lot of what was happening with our female residents, also happening with our male residents the years of trauma, history of abuse, lack of educational opportunities. And so what we've done is we've learned that the things that were happening and we were doing with our women's population can translate over to our men's population. So we overhauled our use of force practices and 
you could say we softened our use of force practices because of things that we learned. We changed the way we do case management based upon what we've learned with our women's services and the role of trauma and other things that I mentioned. So I, I mentioned this because many of you might have areas like this in your department that are gems that can really educate the rest of your peers, your colleagues, the work that you're doing in other areas. You just have to figure out a way to morph them a little bit. The other good examples are search protocols. We had different search protocols for women versus men. Now, our director of women's services is leading an overhaul of how we search male residents in a safe and secure manner, but in a different manner than we've done for the last several decades. And the second thing I'll point out here, um, which is probably more controversial than the last one I just mentioned, is medications for substance use disorder. And this is the state of Maine, along with many of your states, has been ravaged by the opioid epidemic, ravaged. We lost more people in 2021 than we've ever lost before due to overdose deaths in our communities. And we're having to take huge measures across the state, not just as the DOC, to really try to continue to combat this. One of those things that we did in 2020 and into 2021 was probably the biggest swing we could have taken as a department. And that is two things. We made access to medications for opioid use disorder universally available across all of our facilities. So any single individual who had an opioid use disorder who was deemed medically appropriate to need medication for that was allowed to have it. And the second thing we did alongside that is we made it a fully normalized process. And when I say fully normalized, that means that now today, we have 1600 men and women in our facilities. We have roughly 620 receiving medication for opioid use disorder. And they're receiving that medication in our standard medication lines alongside every other medication that they receive. And they do the standard mouth check and they walk back to their rooms or they go to their program, their activity. And I didn't know if I was gonna mention this today because I know that's a topic that doesn't sit well with everybody. But for me, when we relate the work we're doing outside of restrictive housing back to restrictive housing, we know that somebody's substance use disorder, specifically opioid use disorder and others, impact their day-to-day -day behavior in our facilities, impacted them trying to get medications that were being diverted, impacted the black market in our facilities. And I'm not telling you we don't have diversion today. I'm not telling you we don't have a black market but it's much different in our facilities than it was just six months ago because of the normalized process. Much different. Incidents are down. Diversion is down. Trafficking in and out is down. Use is down. Non-appropriate use. So I just, I share that as maybe an example of the extremes we need to go to at times to make impacts across the department. And when we're talking about what a healthy system is, we have to look at all aspects of our department if we're really talking about it from a systemic approach. Next slide. And I'm wrapping up, I promise. I don't know how I'm doing on time. Um, so this just shows what I was just mentioning. Our incidents are down across the department. Okay, these are just some of our key incident markers, physical altercations, use of chemical agents, weapons that are found, self-inflicted injury. And that's all the results of the initiatives that we were just mentioning. The other benefit that you can't see here in a nice number like this or on a nice chart is, and I know you all are dealing with this, at a time when staffing is at a crisis level in nearly every one of our facilities, the systemic approach, the stable approach that we have happening right now in our facilities, which comes back to the respect, the communications, the access and opportunities we've given our resident population and the training we've given our staff, we've been able to operate fully open and for, fully normal while we have historically low number of staff and historically high number of vacancies across our entire state, much like all of you have, probably everybody here. But the only reason we've been able to keep doing what we've been doing is because of all of those initiatives coming together at the same time. And during the pandemic, it's allowed us to have operations continue in a different manner 
when we otherwise probably would have had to lock down in a lot of different ways. So if we can go forward um, two slides, the next one just shows the return to custody rate, perhaps. But I want to jump, I'm going to jump and just talk through some lessons learned if we want to go one more slide forward. Um, just some, some, some takeaways in general um, from the work that we've done. Number one is that you have to find your internal champions and they're out there. But this is probably the most difficult part to the work that we do because we can say everything we want to say. But if we're not in touch with our line staff and if we don't know who those champions are, whether it's an officer, a sergeant, a captain, a behavioral health clinician, whoever it is, they're out there. You have to find those internal champions and make them part of the process. Right? Bring them to your steering committees. Right? Walk alongside them in your facilities and support the work that they're doing. Coach and train them. And then don't just use them for one thing. A lot of the people that we've taken into all those other initiatives that I mentioned came out of our restrictive housing efforts because they rose to the occasion. And we found them as champions. And the credibility that they bring to those rollout processes it's priceless. So find those internal champions. Take risks. Don't be afraid to take risks. Right. One of the other lessons on here is when you take those risks and it goes wrong because it happens is don't change course. Right. Push through. Figure out what happened. Rudder tap a little bit if you need to. But keep pushing forward because we're going to have bumps along the way. And finally, the last point on the slide is this can't happen in a vacuum. Restrictive housing progress, restrictive housing change cannot happen in a vacuum. It has to happen as part of a systemic push. If we can jump forward two slides and then I'll wrap up, but this is really where I wanna just round things out. So these pictures are hard to see and I'm happy to share a video of this if possible, but the, the restrictive housing unit that was featured on Frontline Solitary Nation uh, that we closed down in 2015 has been reopened. And it's been reopened in an entirely repurposed manner that is gonna sweep across all of our facilities. It's already in a second facility as well. But what you see on the left is a full kitchenette out in the day room with a fridge, a stove, a sink, coffee, blah, all those things, right? And what you see on the right is a resident's room painted by the resident in the design that they wanted the TV, the walls, all that sort of thing. The doors don't lock unless they want them locked. They have lockers as if they're in a school to keep their things, right? They can come and go and it's a community. There's a process to get into this. They apply to get in, they get accepted in. Okay, it's gonna house up to 40 individuals, but that's what we've done now with a segregation unit that we closed down, we've transformed into, they're calling it an earned living unit. And again, like I said, we have another one happening at another facility. And we have a third facility is probably going to roll out this approach across most of its secure units in much more of a college-like atmosphere. And so I just close with this because I just tell you it's possible. It's possible to do the things that we all talk about doing. And to not do it in a vacuum of restrictive housing reform or treatment reform or something like that. And again, I understand it's Maine. We have 1,600 men and women incarcerated. But as we said at the beginning, we offer an ability to test things out and learn and, and adapt really fast. And that's what we've done. And that's why we wanted to share it all with you. And we, we welcome visitors all the time. Some of you have been there. Um, some of you probably never want to come back. Um, but we, we welcome you all just to see for yourselves if, if you think it works or not, it doesn't work. Because we think we have a different approach that can really make the impact that we all talk about making in a systemic approach. So thank you all. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. I know you said um, it's Maine and you only have 1,600 folks, we've got 16,000 or just under. We're doing um, that exact same thing at Lee Correctional, which is level three 
maximum security at Turbyville, which is for youthful offenders who, as you said, brains have not fully developed at 25 yet. So it can be done at um, bigger facilities and frankly, facilities that are maximum too. So thank you. Thank you. Yes. If I heard your question fully, how many officers in our restrictive housing unit? Yes. Sure. Yeah, no, great question. Thanks for asking it. Um, and it depends on how many people are in that unit. Um, typically, we operate with two officers, um, one of which can serve as the rover. And the reason that we keep a second officer in there is because right next door, is this new earned living unit. And we don't have officers stationed in that unit at all. Instead, they go in every hour or so and make sure that everything's good. And they can obviously watch them on camera all the time from central control. But that second officer that's next door in the restrictive housing unit has that as their other function as well. Great job, uh, Mike. Really impressive stuff you're doing there in Maine. I think we all learned a lot. Um, I think what can't be overemphasized is how important the treatment team approach is, uh, where you bring security, the relevant civilians, whether it's a psychologist, a social worker, um, the counselor, together to regular meet and discuss one person at a time how they're progressing through whatever program you've devised. You've kind of done our reform a little backwards because we had a major lawsuit on the mentally ill NSHU. And I was the executive deputy commissioner at the time and we created the concept of what we call joint case management committees. Our mental health is a separate state agency, but we partner together to develop the appropriate treatment models for people who are otherwise in SHU. So in addition to the infrastructure changes, bringing them out, to actually bring together the relevant people to discuss each person one at a time and to reinforce the change the culture. What we did is at a central office level created the joint case management committee, right? So that I co-chaired it with the head of OMH. We'd have people like this sitting around and twice a month, one facility would get chosen, we'd tell a video, talk about their case management. So they would conduct their meetings, we would listen, we would have questions. Sometimes if we had to intervene, effectuate a transfer, get someone to a hospital, whatever it was. But the point was, that's how we at central office high level communicated the importance of the culture change, how we were gonna take a very, very different approach. And that whole treatment team concept is now leading into all other new initiatives with SHU and many other things. So I think that's such an important concept and. It's great the way you've done it. Words do matter, as you point out. I love your whole approach of measuring wellness, language, and all of those cultural changes that you're doing. You really make change in big ways and little ways, and you're doing it on a number of levels. So congratulations. Thank you. Allowing me to visit your prison. I know there's a, a piece of get a life here when I'm in Maine for three days to visit my brother and sister I haven't seen in two years. And I spend half a day in prison. But um, it's the real deal. And I want to say that the minute you walk in, you can feel it. And those of us who've spent time in prison know the feeling. We've talked to a lot of your staff and I'm going to tell you they were intensely proud of what was going on. I also talked to a lot of the men there who lived there and they were also proud. And I went in this unit and there were a group of men waiting for me. And the first man who talked to me told me we were on the upper tier. And he said, I'm 22 years into a life sentence. And he pointed down and said, you see that cell right there? That was the first cell I was in when I came to prison 22 years ago. And we had a very intense discussion. And he and some of the other men walked me through the unit, showed me the rooms they were remodeling, showed me their rooms now, the incentive piece of this. And then the staff joined in to talk about how different it was 
for them. And, and we talked about the what's in it for me, for staff, what's in it for me. My life's easier at work because there's hope and there's, and you can feel it everywhere. As we mentioned to the veterans unit, the veterans were raising dogs and training dogs and every piece of this made a difference. And the last thing I want to say, Ryan, is don't discount the small system. I mean, there was a time when I was a warden of a big prison and a big prison system. I thought, you know, it's hard to run a big system. Those lucky people with the little ones, sometimes the smaller is hard because you don't have the flexibility we have. You don't have the resources we have. And so don't sell yourself short. I was totally impressed with every bit of this and was very proud to, to be able to go there. So thank you. And thank you. I would encourage those of you who have the opportunity to look at what you're doing. And I have shared that with other people, including uh, my colleagues in Michigan, that they need to see what you're doing. Thank, thank you. you. Let's give Ryan a round of applause. So thank you, Ryan, for putting that together. Um, thank you to Commissioner Liberty. You're doing excellent work. And I think, um, like Pat said, small or large, um, you eat the elephant one bite at a time, right? So you can start small, even if it's a small facility. So I'm glad we were able to share um, some really impressive work with you. And I hope you um, take some of the lessons that Ryan shared with us back to your own systems and, and try to apply those. So I'm the only thing standing in between you and lunch. So thank you, Kevin, for uh, allowing me to chair this committee and, and President Precise. Thanks, Dr. Thornell. Great job. Leanne, appreciate it. You always bring it. Great session. Uh, great job leading us into lunch. Um, perfect segue for what we just talked about, right? Uh, what well, we just talked about a little bit ago with the Clements Project. You know, there are some, some amazing things that are happening overseas, but there's equally some amazing things happening right here uh, within our own country. And so that's why we're taking this kind of parallel approach where we're going to be sending folks around this table to great systems like Maine and North Dakota and others that we've got going on. Um, South Carolina, some of the cool things you guys are doing down there, Brian, and, and just getting you guys in front of each other and, and coming up with ways to pay for that. And uh, it's going to be really, really cool. So